Robert, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to talk to you. Uh, I when I researched your story, it was it was absolutely jaw dropping, and it was probably one of my favorite stories that I've uh, worked on because I really didn't know much about you, and then I, I dove deep, and it's really really mm -hmm. interesting. So let's start with tell me about the day that you were born. Yep. So um, let me tell you about the day I was born. So. I was born in the early 1970s, um, the youngest of five children to a pretty, you know, working class, middle class family um, and uh, no, um, uh, no kind of uh, prenatal scans in the early 1970s. So um, when I was born, my parents were um, expecting a, a perfectly healthy and a perfectly normal um, child, not that I'd necessarily consider all my siblings normal, but um, uh, as normal as one could um, hope. Uh, but um, when I was born, I was in labour, um, uh, and as soon as I was born, um, my mother had a sense from the doctors that something was wrong, and she immediately asked, is my baby okay? And the doctor said, no, um, he's got a, a big tumour in the middle of his um, head and um, problems with his legs. So what had happened uh, is during my development, um, a big tumour had formed in the middle of my face um, where my nose should have been, probably about the size of a small baby's fist, um, so pretty big on a, on a newborn baby. Um, and it had formed early and kind of, you know, made a mess of the development of my face. It had, it had kind of subsumed my nose. It had pushed my eyes to the side of my head. So I don't know if you can see it, but if you look closely, you can kind of see some dents um, mm -hmm. in the side of my head. And that's where my eyes were when I was born. So when I was born, my eyes were essentially at the um, at the side of my head, kind of like a fish or a bird. Um, uh, and also I had um, uh, two deformed legs. So my right leg was almost as long as it should have been, but had a, a foot at a kind of odd angle. My left leg was much shorter than it should have been and only had a couple of toes on, on the foot. Now, I was taken away before my mother even got to see me, um, taken to the nursery, and my mum was um, taken to the intensive care unit um, uh, after the doctors had explained what had, what had gone wrong. And um, my mum actually didn't see me for the first week I was born. And my father was actually the first of my parents to uh, to see me. And um, he went and he came up to the hospital, um, uh, went to see me and then went to see my mum and um, uh, explained what I looked like. Uh, they cried together, obviously a bit of a challenge for new parents, um, even parents who'd, who'd had kids before. Um, you know, seeing what was... 100%, uh, you know, a monstrously ugly baby, not what they were expecting, not what they were prepared for. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and and my mum just didn't want to see me straight away. Yeah. And did, to what did they attribute the tumour? Um, look, my, my mother, the best they can figure out, and it's not 100% um, certain, but the, to the best they can figure out, um, my mother was on some antidepressants before she mm. um, knew she was uh, pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the thinking at the time was perhaps it was that, um, but there was no 100% um, uh, you know, scientific link to it. So right. as, far, as far as I know, it's still, it, it's still a bit of a mystery, though um, mm. uh, I was kind of offered the chance to try and um, pursue some um, litigation uh, when I when I my parents offered that opportunity when I was when I was younger and they mm -hmm. declined it and then when I when I turned eighteen I was given the opportunity and I kind of declined it as well um, but that's that's the best the doctors can think litigation against the drug company yes I see I see um, so what's very interesting. I when I was reading your story, I I saw that your mom had this journal uh, in which she wrote down her thoughts, and there are two sentences that I read, and I, yeah. I just I had to pause. Oh, you have yeah. it. This is it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. 
Wow. So was this a journal that she just kept in general or was this a journal that she started when you were born? No, she started it when I was born. Um, uh, I think one of one of the um, pieces of advice she was given um, a month or so after I was born as she was kind of working through all her feelings mm-hmm. um, was just to, to write some stuff down and, and um, write it down for herself in the first instance um, uh, just to kind of capture her thoughts and reflect on them and, and keep them in one place. And, um, and, and yeah, she, she did that. Do you, do you mind sharing just a line or two from the very first entry or right after you yeah. were born? That's amazing. Uh, let me, I'll, 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 I'll read you a couple of bits. So okay. it starts on, on um, Friday, the 21st of July, when my mum went into labour. Um, uh Friday, 21st July, 1972, I I knew today that my fifth baby was on the way to being born. Contractions were five minutes apart when I phoned Vince, my dad, at work. Mm -hmm. Um, He came home fairly quickly. (laughs) At Norman Park, which is kind of halfway between where we lived in the hospital, um, um, some young hoons, um, um, some young kids uh, jumped in the middle of the road, waving their arms about and playing chicken with the car. Um, Vince wanted to get out and have a have a go at them. Um, <laughs> never, never mind the baby, that can wait. Um, by the time I was admitted, labour was well advanced with contractions two minutes apart. By all rules and regulations, my baby should have arrived fairly quickly, being the fifth. But at 2am, labour suddenly stopped and didn't restart for another 30 hours. Huh. So that's the start of it. I, would, you like, would you like another bit after I was born? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Let me just find. Oh, so she, she's a very good writer. <laughs> she is a very good writer. Um, and, 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 you know, God bless, I don't know if you can see the detail, but it's incredibly neat um, wow. as well. Um, yes. I do not have hand, not, hand, handwriting that is anywhere as neat. Um, <laughs> so hang on, let me... Um, So let me just read you a few other bits. Yes. I knew, I knew that my baby was not okay. Strangely, strangely enough, during the last couple of months of pregnancy, I had said to Vince on more than one occasion that there was something wrong. The doctors kept asking me how I knew. My only reply was, how does a mother know when her child is in trouble? Um, I can't describe how I felt in one word, shattered, brokenhearted, afraid, upset any adjective would almost um describe how i felt providing it wasn't describing happiness um Mm -hmm. i was distraught um what a birthday present so the day after i was born was my mother's birthday okay Um, so she she was expecting um (laughs) a lovely um fifth child as her birthday present um and alas she got me um uh and um yeah, what what mum what they thought was because um, my legs and my feet were deformed. Um, I think the they ended up figuring out that when I was kind of kicking in the womb, it just felt really sharp and a lot different. Mm. And that was some of the kind of um, feelings that I that I had. Um, but yeah, it's it's probably it's a whole. What is it? It's. There's a whole, you know, it goes on and on and on all the way through. There's a hundred and, hang on, it's numbered. There's, oh, hang on. Um, there's about 250 pages um, of notes and, and writing, and it was just an incredibly, well, it's, it's an incredibly um, uh, important um, thing for me personally and it was a lovely, lovely resource when I was writing my book. Wow. And how long did she keep the journal for? The day um, you were born? It probably, it, it captures probably the first um, six or seven years of my life until I'm kind of in, in the second grade at school really well and really closely. Um, and then it's a bit intermittent um, from there on in. Got it. And uh, so I I read that 
uh, one thing that she wrote in her journal uh, that you've said before was um, she wrote, I wished he would go away or die or something. I just wanted to be finished with it all. And you reading these passages, it shows how she kind of worked through her feelings of she was clearly distraught. It's not mm -hmm. what she was expecting. What do you make of, or what did you make of these words as you were growing up? And what do you make of them today? Yeah. I think, um, you know, it, it was it was a bit difficult to to grapple with when I was growing up, um, Polina, but 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 not overly difficult. And and I think the way I like to explain it was, um, uh, you know, I knew the story had a happy ending, um, and, and I think it's one of the things I actually took from both of my parents, and particularly my mum being so honest about her feelings. Um, uh, you know, um, now more so than ever, um, I think a lot of people expect things to be perfectly formed and um, perfectly mature and wonderful um, on arrival, um, but they're not. Um, you know, you don't go from the first scene of a movie or a book to the last scene of a movie or a book. You actually, that journey in the middle is really important. Um, but I think um, certainly um, uh, my mum um, didn't want to see me uh, when I was born. So for the first um, uh, week or so of my life, uh, the doctors, nurses would say to my mother, come on, Mary, let's go see your, um, your son. Because other, um, other than my deformities, I was perfectly healthy. Um, so I was just in the nursery. Um, uh, but my mum kept refusing day after day. She just kept saying no. Uh, then um, a week after I was born, uh, she finally changed her mind, came up and saw me. And just, I think, um, uh, you know, as a, as a coping mechanism, just decided then and there that she didn't want me. Um, uh, and, wow. and that was her way um, of uh, dealing with that. She just said, no, I don't want anything to, to do with this baby. As you said, I just wish you'd go away, um, wish I didn't have to deal with the problem. And, and I do get, I, you know, I reflect on that a lot because I think it's, um, you know, when you can actually understand it, you can see it as being quite a reasonable and, and normal reaction to that kind of shock. Um, hmm. uh, and and it, I don't find it particularly distressing as an adult um, because I do know it had a happy ending. I do know that, um, you know, it might have taken my parents a month, and it, um, um, but they took me home um, and they were incredibly loving and wonderful um, and caring parents uh, who equipped me with an awful lot of really important and, and useful strategies to get through life. Um, but I think there's, there's, the underlying lesson, I think, and, and this is something that served me really well throughout my life, that, you know, uh, not everything has to be okay all at once. And, and I think if you can accept that and work through some of the challenges and perhaps understand that, um, uh, you know, getting to clarity and, and getting to an outcome you want often involves a whole lot of messiness along the way, um, then that's actually a really valuable thing to understand. Absolutely. Um, and can you describe what your childhood was like at home and then out into the world at school yeah. and at other? Yeah, I think in, in many ways, um, my childhood was, a, you know, a perfectly normal um, uh, childhood. We lived in the suburbs. Um, you know, we had a, a big backyard. Um, not a huge house. Um, so there was, our house was three bedrooms, um, an eating kitchen, a lounge room, a toilet and a bathroom. That, that's it, a total of seven rooms. So we spent um, a lot of time playing in the yard. I was downstairs um, playing with my siblings, uh, um, running around the yard. And, I, and, and so I think probably, and this is probably really important from um, uh, part of my perspective of, of, of growing up a bit more normal. Um, you know, I had a, had a, you know, a perfectly great childhood in, in many respects and a, a childhood that was not significantly different from that of my siblings 
or the kids who live next door or, or down the street. Um, you know, we, um, you know, arguing over one television in the house in those days, arguing over who got to watch what show on TV, um, uh, being told to eat your dinner and eat your vegetables and <laughs> come inside when it was tea time, dinner time and all those kinds of things. Um, and then I think as I kind of grew a bit older, I started to understand I was uh, a bit different. Um, how, and, how old were you when you kind of realised that? Uh, probably when I was probably a, a, a little bit before I started school. So probably okay. when I was, um, you know, probably by the time I was five. And there's mm -hmm. certainly only really kind of um, distant and hazy memories. But, you know, uh, certainly... Um, reflecting on um you know going to going to the mall going to the shops um uh my mother was just incredibly um self-conscious uh because a lot of people would stare and point um and not just kids I think you know you, kids have a natural curiosity and and it's it's their way of understanding the world is asking questions and pointing out things that that don't make sense to them so of course kids do that but my mum, um, you know, th that felt awkward for my mum. Um, and also adults, some adults were, um, you know, incredibly rude as well and would come up and ask mum unnecessary questions. And um, and that, you know, I, I could, I think I could kind of um, see and experience her um, anxiety with that. So that was kind of a bit of a sense that, well, it, there's something different or something wrong about me. Um, and also um, my father um, had entirely different coping mechanisms. He would take uh, take the kids swimming to the local sw swimming pool. Um, you know, uh, we live in a lovely part of Australia that's um, quite, quite warm, um, quite nice to, to go swimming. I love swimming. Um, and of course, when I'm swimming, you know, I'd have kids pointing at me because I didn't have legs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my father would, would not feel an out, ounce of anxiety around that at all. He'd just tell the kids to go away because their parents wanted them or something. Um, <laughs> so, so I had a bit of that sense, um, Polina. And then certainly when I got to school, um, it was really obvious how different I was from other kids. Um, I'd, I'd had some operations by then to kind of move my um, eyes to the front of my head, but I, but I still looked a, a lot different from other kids. Um, other kids had legs. Um, I had prosthetics by then because um, um, my feet had been amputated so I could wear prosthetics. Um, and I got a really good sense that um, in grade one, just how different I was. And I think um, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't kind of classify it as kind of quite, um, you know, quite vicious or, or quite mean or targeted bullying from large groups of kids. It, it wasn't that. But certainly there were, you know, reasonably constant, um, you know, sometimes teasing, sometimes name calling, um, sometimes, um, uh, you know, bullying, pointing out how different you were. Um, and so, you know, certainly by the time I was in um, year one, year two, I had a really good idea of, of how different I, I was from most other kids. Mm. So th this is the part of your story where I, I really, really relate to and I, I try to remember how I felt in certain situations. Um, I, I was born in Bulgaria and we moved to the United States when I was eight. Um, mm -hmm. So... It, you know, in Bulgaria, everything was fine, right? And then yeah. when we, I had a lot of friends, everything was great. When we got here, I didn't speak any English. So when I started school, you know, yeah. I, as, a, as an adult, I completely understand it now. You, you're kind of weird. You eat weird lunches. <laughs> uh, you don't speak the language. It's yeah. all the cultural, social norms are off. Um, so, you know, I, I, I see it now, but then I remember... It, it, it was brutal at the time, but I think looking back on it, I think that when you've been made fun of as a kid, you develop this sort of early mental resilience that a lot mm. of people don't get until later in life. Mm. And what 
do, do you have any memories of how you internally dealt with always kind of being the outcast or the odd one out? And, and how did you work through that? Uh, let me think. I think there's probably, there's probably a couple of things. I think um, um, uh, certainly, um, you know, I had a sense that that, that kind of bullying, that teasing was connected to my reality. So, mm. you know, um, I had to kind of grapple with the fact that, uh, you know, I was the way I was um, and that it wasn't something that, um, you know, I, I wasn't going to go to sleep one night and magically grow legs overnight and and have, you know, um, wake up wake up looking like a movie star. That wasn't going to happen. So I think I think it probably... One thing in terms of building re resilience is um, it made me come to may it made me come to grips with my circumstances really early, and um, and certainly understand um, what my circumstances were, and and probably understand the degree the degree to which um, I could change, and more importantly, not change them. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one thing. Um, I think, um, and my parents really struggled with this a lot and they, you know, and, and, and parents grapple with this for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, uh, they were trying to work out to what degree they protected me and, and, you know, mm -hmm. tried to pull me away from experiencing all of this versus, you know, understanding that I had to make my way in the world and that I needed exposure um, to that. So I think, um, you know, my parents did a really good job of protecting me and, and um, uh, sticking up for me, but also not, not to the point of, um, you know, I wasn't homeschooled, I wasn't taken away, um, um, I went out and did things the other, other kids did and they tried to help me kind of, you know, understand that, um, you know, bullying and, and teasing and pointing and name calling um, wasn't, wasn't the right thing. And, and I didn't have to accept the, the negativity and meanness that came with that. But also that, um, you know, uh, it was part of the world. And if I wanted to, to, to make my way in the world, then I, I had to figure out a way to to deal with that. Um, so they're, they're probably two really key things. Um, but then I kind of think, um, uh, and, and I'm not sure if there was one single point or, or one single moment where I kind of flipped this switch, but I think um, understanding that some of that name calling and teasing was kind of, you know, connected to my reality, I also started to figure out um, that um, uh, the, the names themselves didn't have power over me. Um, you know, kids, kids kind of teasing um, can be, um, you know, it can be an exclusionary tactic. But I think when, when you're that young um, and, and kids are either just asking questions or being silly or pointing or laughing because you look funny, um, um it, it's it's not designed to kind of um it's not necessarily designed to exclude you from anything um that hmm. they, 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 they they're just doing it because it's part of their way of or sometimes part of their way of making sense of the world and so um uh, i i think for me it was kind of understanding that um absolutely sometimes and 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 as I got older and particularly into um, when I was much later in, in school, in, in high school, um, uh, you know, absolutely there, there could be a really deep meanness there. Um, but, but I think over time I kind of understood that um, that name calling didn't necessarily have um, um, a huge power over me mm -hmm. um, unless I granted it that power. And I think I think about this a lot because I think um, 
I don't think my experience of disability and difference is necessarily reflective of everyone's. And so I think I've got to be careful not to say I'm I'm speaking on behalf of um, right. everyone with facial difference or with a disability, because I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, unlike, um, unlike issues of um, um, gender or sexuality or race, things around disability are, are, are so much, um, everyone's experience is, is often really different. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I think I'm really lucky in that um, being able to understand early um, that I was different and having parents who um, just got the balance right in terms of um, giving me exposure to the world without um, um uh, protecting me too much, but also giving me a safe space where um, at home I was just treated perfectly normal, like all the other kids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read. I read how your parents kind of treated you, just as they treated your siblings. Absolutely. Um, and so, how many total operations or surgeries have you had? Twenty uh, three. Yeah. Wow. So, um, In, yeah, no, I was, I was just going to say, tell me, tell me about at age 14, there was a pivotal moment that you yeah. had. So I think I've, I've had a couple of really big surgeries. Um, one, when I was, uh, four and a half, um, uh, the doctors wanted to get me, um, looking as normal as possible before I went, um, to school. Uh, so, um, that's when, um, they move my eyes from the side of my head to the front of, um, my face. Um, and they also built me a new nose. Um, so they took one of, um, they decided to amputate my feet when I was four and a half so I could wear prosthetics. Um, they tried to get me work walking, um, on, um, one prosthetic and, um, using my normal right leg, but it just wasn't working. So, um, they decided I'd be better off with two prosthetics. And they built me a they built me a nose, this nose, out of um uh out of um one of my right toes. Mm. And my parents had to make that decision. Obviously, I was four and a half. Um and and they took a long time to decide. Um that my father was um because you know that was 19 early 1977. Um, um a big operation, a really big operation, a, a not insignificant chance of dying if things went wrong. Um, wow. and, and my parents grappled with that. And I think my father, um, you know, um, not the most attractive of men <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, uh, just kind of said, well, it's not worth the risk of him dying. He's perfectly healthy. Um, and I think my mum, and I think it probably comes from her being a woman and, and understanding how unfairly people, especially women, are, are judged on their appearance. Um, I think sat, uh, sat and argued with dad f- for a long time and eventually convinced him. So, and that obviously went fine. And then um, I'd had a few other operations. And by the time I was in my early teens, um, the doctors were really worried about um, me going through puberty and, and whether I might be able to form um, relationships with um, women or, or partners. And um, and so they took to my parents uh, a plan to do another really big operation. Obviously, um, 10 years after that first operation, um, you know, techniques, medicine, surgery had advanced. And um, I, think, uh, I think doctors um, and I had, um, the same set of um, uh, neurosurgeons, plastic surgeons um, for the first 20 years of my life. Um, right. And I think they're a bit like artists. I think I think it was a book unfinished to them and a bit of artwork unfinished. And they're like, oh, we've got all these new tools and new techniques. We think we can actually um, um, do a better job um, on Robert now. And we actually think it's important given he's about to go into puberty. Um, so what they wanted to do uh, was they were going to get rid of some of the scars on my face. Um, they were going to fill in the dents in the side of um, my head where my eyes had been. Um, they were going to um, make me a new nose again um, that looked much more normal. And um, 
my eyes are still a little bit further apart than they should be. So they wanted to move the orbit. They wanted to move my eyes probably, I don't know, half an inch closer um, together because uh, I think um, building me a new nose would just emphasise my eyes was a little bit further apart than they should be. So um, they worked up the plan um, and they talked to my parents um, and, and then my parents did the absolute worst thing they've ever done to me <laughs> in my entire life. And um, they said, well, Robert, it's up to you. Oof. You know, you're, you're a young man, um, uh, you know, you're um, in, in your teens. Um, it's, it's your life. It's your face. It's your choice. And I don't, I don't know if you remember um, what, um, you know, fourteen-year-old boys were like um, when you were growing <laughs> up. Um, but, but I was in—I was in grade nine, and um, absolutely one hundred percent. I cannot think of a worse form of humanity than grade nine boys. Oh, absolutely. Me, me, me included. <laughs> I, I, I'm not excluding myself from that. Right. I, was, I was a terrible child. Um, but that was a real, um, you know, it was really hard, um, a really hard choice because then it's like, well, you know, I'm I'm starting to look at girls and like, oh, I think I like girls, but I'm like, right. Yeah. But then you're also kind of going, well, why would any girl be interested in something like this? And how am I going to um, form relationships? How am I going to get a girlfriend? All of those kinds of things. Um, and so I just kind of grappled with that for a long time. I talked to my parents and um, talked to the doctors about, well, what, what would it involve? What would I look like afterwards? And, and you know, all the kind of things a kid's going to ask, how much is it going to hurt? Um, <laughs> um, they had this grand plan that um, I they do the operation in between um, the end of grade nine and the start of grade 10, um, which, which, they were thinking was an advantage because that it meant I wouldn't miss much school. And I'm like, oh, man, if I have to have an operation and all this pain, can't I at least miss some school? Yeah. Um, and we talked about it for months and months. And eventually we got to the time where the kind of we had to commit. And, um, and so I sat down again with my parents at our kitchen table. Um, my, my eldest brother, who's 10 years older than me, was there as well. And we're just talking through it again. And we talked through this time and time again, um, talked through, you know, um, what I might look like, um, how it might help, um, what the repercussions might be. And, you know, there, there's a bunch of repercussions. Um, the operation may not work. So, um, you know, I mightn't look much better. Um, you know, with any surgery, um, particularly on the face, there's risk of infection and there's risk of complications. Uh, but because they were moving the orbits of my eyes again, um, there was a, a 25% chance I might go blind. Wow. And uh, my brother probably said one of the wisest things um, I've ever heard then, which was like, well, what, what use is it, is it looking um, pretty if he can't even see himself? That's such and a I think, good point. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and it kind of crystallised to me right then and there that, uh, you know, I, I never thought I was going to, you know, um, I was not going to be Tom Cruise, I was not going to be, um, you know, film star good looking. I wasn't going to be um, uh, a male model. Um, and so I just decided then and there that I wasn't going to have, not only was I not going to have that operation, I wasn't going to have any more operations um, at all. That's amazing. Wow. And I Did stayed it? through that. So, and, and so I, I read about this and, and the thing that I kept thinking was how mature and crazy that you made this decision at 14 years old, mm -hmm. given that that's, that's the exact time, like you mentioned, there's all this like social pressure okay. and uh, kids and, and it, it's like, how, how did you have the foresight? But I, I guess, I mean, the, the point that your brother made is very, very uh, accurate. Yeah. Um, and so from there on, was there a part of you that was just committed? You were like, this is how I will look for the rest of my life. And mm -hmm. that's it. Um, yes, it was funny. Um, 
because after that, I I had a, a you know a group of medical specialists, and um, from then until I was about twenty, um, I'd go and um, just see them every year, and okay. it was great. They'd all sit in a big circle. Your um, your orthodontist, um, your plastic surgeon, your neurosurgeon, <laughs> your, um, your orthopedic specialist, the psychologist, and you kind of you walk around this room, and they give you a third degree, and and they're just trying to assess how you're going um, physically, psychologically. Um, and uh, every year for about um, uh, five years after that, they would still ask me, they'd ask me again, have you thought any more? Would you like to do uh, another operation? And they weren't, they absolutely were not putting pressure on me, but I think they just thought it was probably um, important to ask. Um, and every, every time I said, um, every time I said no, obviously, and I think I'd like to say, Polina, that I was 100% steadfast, but, um, you know, there absolutely were, were instances when, you know, I felt a bit isolated when um, I was um, rejected by a girl for probably perfectly good reasons of just being a <laughs> not very pleasant young man, um, uh, where I thought, oh, maybe, um, but but not... Um, not to the point of kind of shaking that ultimate resolve that was underneath all of it. Um, and, I, you know, I am pretty vain. I'm lucky I've got a good head of hair. Um, uh, um, so I am, I am pretty vain in terms of how I look <laughs> and the stuff I can, can, I can control. But I, I think I got to the point um, pretty quickly after that that I just made peace with the stuff I could not control and that... Um, uh, I, I made peace with that and I kind of projected um, a sense that others needed to make peace with it as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because to me, it's like if it was somebody else in your shoes, they might have had a completely different journey, like you mentioned, yeah. and, and not come to peace with that and have terrible, you know, um, psychological effects because mm -hmm. of the name calling, the teasing, just just you know, being different. Mm -hmm. um, so how practically were you able to reframe the word ugly and begin to own it in a way that wasn't hurtful, mm -hmm. but, you know, you started to accept yourself for who you were and understood that ugly and beautiful are kind of subjective. Yeah. I, I think there's probably a couple of parts to it. I think one, um, um, uh, I, I was, I was incredibly fortunate with the, the life I had. So, um, and I kind of started to understand the opportunities that had been presented to me, the pathways that had um, uh, come before me because of the way I was. So, um, you know, when, and it was, it was incredibly um, insightful, accidentally insightful, but um Certainly when I was growing up, um, uh, I was the first one in um, uh, my school to um, go all the way to senior. So um, all of my other brothers and sisters um, finished school at year 10 um, mm. and I was the first one to go all the way to, um, wow. to grade 12. I was also the first one to go to college um, in, um, amongst my siblings. And the reason for that was um, in the kind of, um, you know, early to mid 80s, um, my, um, my father had just been a, a skilled and unskilled labourer all his life. Um, my, my, my brothers were doing something similar. Um, my sisters were working as, as secretaries, um, doing uh, administration work. And, and my father said to me again and again and again, Robert, you're, you're, you're not going to make a living um, digging ditches. Um, uh, you know, you, you're just not. So you've got to study. Um, and so I think, um, and I really understand that um, uh, that my, my parents um, put pressure, necessary pressure and understandable pressure on me to actually study and do well at school and go to grade 12 Um because they knew um, that um, I wasn't going to be able to do kind of manual labour to earn a living, um, mm -hmm. you know, head of head of probably 
10 years ahead of the rest of the economy um, um, <laughs> when those kinds of jobs were disappearing anyway. Um, so that was actually that was actually good. The fact I was the way I was, the fact I had a disability um, um, opened up opportunities for me. And I think being able to understand, I had to go through those opportunities and then reflect back on them. But that kind of helped me kind of make peace with um, uh, um, who I was and how I was. Um, absolutely, there were things that um, opportunities denied to me and, and things I, I, I couldn't do because of my disability and the way I looked. Um, but by the time I was a, a young adult, you know, I was reasonably happy with my life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd gone to college, um, I'd had relationships, uh, I, I had a job um, at working as a journalist, which I loved, um, and, um, uh, you know, life wasn't perfect um, and no one's life is perfect, but I kind of understood that um, as much as my disability and, and facial difference had um, curtailed some aspects um, of um, my life and, and possibilities in front of me, that actually opened up this huge blossom of other opportunities and, and other pathways for me, um, and that was incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that that was one thing. Um, you know, I was also, I had plenty of friends and I had plenty of friends who kind of, um, you know, they 100% they accepted, understood um, my difference, um, but our friendship wasn't dependent upon it. You know, it was it was a big part of it. Um, you know, they always acknowledged that as being part of me, but, you know, there were plenty of reasons to like or or dislike me, um, not, at all, <laughs> not at all related to that. So I think I had a really good uh, a sense of friendship from a lot of people um, that was um, uh, not, um, that acknowledged um, how I was different but wasn't, wasn't dependent or defined by that. Um, and the other thing I think, Paulina, that it gave me um, the sense to understand, and I think this is really, really helpful, um, you know, and, and you talked about your experience coming from Bulgaria. You know, what I kind of got a sense of reasonably early is everyone's got something going on in their life. Um, you know, there's me, a, a kid who's, who, who's ugly and doesn't have any legs. There's you, who's a little girl from Bulgaria. There might be another kid who looks perfectly normal and speaks perfectly good English, but her parents are getting a divorce or, mm -hmm. you know, her dad's an alcoholic or, you know, every, I think um, it, it and, and spending a lot of time in hospital kind of gave me um, an opportunity to understand um, uh, that, that almost everyone's got something in their life that is important to them and, and they feel different about. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you can actually step back from that and try and understand people um, in, in a way that um, doesn't, um, that acknowledges and doesn't dismiss their difference, it's yes. really powerful because you're trying to, you're, you're, trying, you're not trying to be polite. You're not trying to pretend that your English is perfect. You're actually sitting down at lunch, watching you eat your weird food, trying to have a conversation with you um, because they like, they like playing with you in the school ground. Yes, exactly. And, and, and I think I'm drawn to stories of difference because I, I know that and I understand that no matter what we look like, everybody has something going on. Um, mm. I was actually reading about um, a man named Kyle Carpenter, and he's a war veteran. Uh, he had, I believe he underwent more than 40 surgeries to reconstruct his face and his body after he threw himself on a hand, on top of a hand wow. grenade uh, to protect yeah. his friend. Um, so he said something that kind of stuck with me. He said that he believes that everyone has scars some of mm. our scars are just visible, whereas others are invisible. Um, and he says that many of us hide hide them out of fear that people might be repulsed by them. So I want to ask you, like, what are some practical questions that 
we can ask each other in order to maybe have more empathy for one another and mm -hmm. what we're going through? Um, I think probably asking, I mean, um, asking people how they are um, is, is a really, is a really simple start. And actually um, meaning it. <laughs> actually meaning it. Um, but then I think um, um, being, and this is really challenging, um, and, and this is me personally as well, um, just, just asking people about their experience and mm -hmm. um, um, if you understand something about their life, having a conversation with them, I think, um, um, uh, for, for, certainly for adults, put, put kids aside for a moment. Um, I'm, I'm really open to people having a discussion with me about my difference and my disability and, and how I look. Cause it's, you know, um, particularly as, um, um, you know, I become closer friends with people. Um, and I kind of, one of the things I like to do is give people signals that I'm comfortable talking about that. But I think um, uh, asking out of curiosity to understand is really, um, really valuable and, and letting, um, trying to let people lead that conversation because not everyone's comfortable about talking about their circumstances. Um, 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 understanding that not, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of things. There's myriad things that that go into defining people and who they are, what they believe, and and how they behave, um, and and kind of not expecting that there's a single cause for everything in in someone's life. And um, you know, I, I absolutely imagine that um, you know how you are as an adult is shaped by you coming to the US at such a young age. But, um, you know, I, 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 I would think I'm wrong if that was the only thing that shaped you. There's a whole bunch of other things I imagine. And so I think being, um, being unafraid to be open and ask people is really powerful. Um, um, and, and I think, and this is not entirely accepted by everyone in, in the disability community. And, and um, I, um, and so I'm absolutely not speaking on, on behalf of um, uh, everyone, but I'm kind of, I'm really comfortable with people asking me why mm -hmm. I'm different, how I'm different and, and what, what that's been like. And I think for me, um, that's a lesson that I take from all the way back from my mother. Um, because I think, um, and it's a lesson that I just kind of learn from kids repeatedly. Um, we can't, we can't get from, you know, challenge to um, challenge to total acceptance without the journey in the middle. So I think um, if if you can um, ask people how they are, tell me a bit about yourself. Um, you know, how how much did how, how much does your experience as a child having this challenge or this challenge or this challenge shaped you? Um, tell me about your life now. I think um, for me personally, it's, um, it's pretty easy to um, separate well-meaning curiosity, even if it's sometimes, um, you know, isn't uh, couched in entirely appropriate terms with something that's designed to belittle or, or, or be mean yes. about. So, so I think um, um, not, not shying away from asking people about their experience um, in, because you want to be polite. Because I think um, if someone's being, if someone's getting to know me uh, at work as a friend, um, um, you know, I want them to kind of understand who I am and, and the things I've grappled with and how that shaped me, shaped me. And if, um, if they're trying to avoid particular subjects or conversations out of politeness, it just kind of, it, it ultimately feels like it, it is shutting off a big part of me to a discussion mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. One of actually, one of my favorite questions that kind of gets to the heart of what you're saying is, asking people 
like you said, what was the most formative event in your childhood that you believe shaped you into who you are today? Because I find it fascinating what people bring up, even mm. if it's something very, very small, you understand how that person sees the world because of yeah. that thing. Um, and I, I, I do think that curiosity as an adult, you know how to express it. But I think mm -hmm. a lot of the teasing and the bullying and the name calling as a kid and in most some, you know, circumstances is just like a misdirected curiosity because you yeah. don't know. Right. One hundred percent. I think, um, um, you know, often um, if I if I'm in a, if I'm in a supermarket or a mall, um, you know, uh, sometimes um you know, there might be a young kid, three or four, who's pointing and going, you know, mum, dad, th that man has a funny nose or he's walking <laughs> funny. Um, and, and then you can kind of see it, uh, what I like to do is is watch the reactions from parents because, you know, that their reaction is almost one of trying to, um, you know, uh, tell a kid to be quiet out of politeness. And I'm like, I, I, and I just like to give them a smile and go, it's okay because kids, a kid's asking out of curiosity, mm -hmm. and I think um, you know uh, children are just question machines. It's how they make sense of the world. Why this? Why that? How this? Why not this? And and they're always trying to work out um, um, why things are the way they are, and you know they form mental models of the world based on the things they come into. Uh, they encounter day in, day out. And when they see something um, uh, different or unique or weird or ugly or whatever, um, um, it's actually a really good opportunity for them to question and broaden their understanding, even if it comes across as kind of teasing um, or something mm -hmm. that that is um, a, 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 a little bit mean. But I always look upon that as a really good opportunity to kind of um, expand the conversation rather than shut it down. Yes. And you you have kids of your own now. Um, so how do you teach them to look beyond the, you know so many labels that society inevitably imposes on all of us uh, and in and, and, to be curious beyond superficial appearances, even if it's not, you know, obvious. Is that is that something you teach or is that something that they've grown up with you and they've seen you go through these things so they kind of know? Well, it's 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 funny you mention that. I um I kind of, you know, I, I lived in fear, um, certainly with my older daughter, um, and and not so much um my younger kids, because I think I learned better. I was really worried that um, one day my kids would, you know, figure out that dad was different and had a funny face and no legs. And I kind of like, I was just kind of stealing myself for this conversation where they'd come up and go, oh, dad, why don't, why is your nose that way? And why is your head bumpy? And why don't you have legs? Um, but, but reflecting back on that, it was actually much more natural and much more relaxed because they they were incorporating in their view of the world that this is just kind of normal that people are like this, um, and I think there's mm. a really um, you know it's really important to equip kids with the ability to understand that things are different, um, and and I think um, I think that's a really useful tool that if you can if they can understand that not everything's going to be the way they expect all the time and not everyone is going to be the way they expect all the time and that um people are different and people are different in a whole bunch of ways i think that's really powerful mm -hmm. uh, and they you know absolutely they um you know their kid my kids know their dad's um different um they they know i've got um, a, a nose made out of my toes um, and they don't remark on it very often it's just the way their dad is they know I've got robot legs um, um, <laughs> uh, and and you know they talk to other kids about it um, and and they're pretty relaxed about kind of um, even when other kids are you know pointing or um, 
uh, asking questions. They're pretty relaxed about it. And so I think there's not, I don't think there's one tool or one question um, or one way of, um, uh, one kind of way of kind of getting kids um, ready for that. But I think if if people are um, just equipping their their kids with an understanding that the world is a different place and there's a lot of difference in the world um, and that they can be curious about that without being judgmental. And I think um, that's been a real key for me as an adult, understanding that um, uh, curiosity isn't necessarily judgment. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. it can be, and I've certainly encountered um, instances where it, where it has been, but often um, curiosity is just curiosity. And if we take the opportunity to um, reward that curiosity and expand um, um, particularly kids' view of the world, it's, it's incredibly valuable for us and them. That's amazing. Yeah, I 100% I agree. Um, you've said before, uh, I love this quote, you said, beauty is a contested space. Notions of what is or isn't beautiful are constantly changing. Beauty isn't the end point of a treasure map. It's actually a million different destinations with a million different ways of getting there. What does beauty mean to you now? Oh, wow. Um, I think... Um... I have a beautiful wife. I have beautiful kids. Um, uh, I, I, it's it's really hard to define as one thing for me. I think for me, it's about um, an essence and an energy um, and a and a sense of self. Um, and I think um, you know I'm incredibly uh, engaged and attracted to people have a, who have a good sense of themselves and are comfortable with who they are um, and, um, you know, absolutely um, um, can see people who are aesthetically pleasing and, you know, might meet very um, uh, common definitions of beauty and there's nothing wrong with that and, and um, that's absolutely one of the um, kind of ways I define beauty now. But also I'm incredibly... Um, uh, I'm incredibly drawn to people who just have a very good um, sense of themselves and a comfort with who they are. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a big world and a lot of people are attracted to a lot of different things. And I think, um, um, you know, my, it, it, you know, I, I might have, I might have a um, a broader sense of beauty than some other people, um, but but it's not that my sense of beauty is the right one. It's that um, different people have different senses of beauty, and that um, you know what um, there's not one narrow definition of beauty. Uh, and that's why, that's why I talk about it not being a, a kind of treasure map. You're not finding, trying to find a path to, to something buried. It's actually saying that there's just, that there's almost an infinite way of, of um, people finding um, beauty um, in and through others. And, and yeah. I think if people can, um, uh, if people have the opportunity and not everyone does, and I think, um, I think my experience and, and I think a lot of my choices might actually have been significantly different if, if I was a woman or I was a girl. Um, uh, but I think if people can, um, you know, take the opportunity to be comfortable with themselves, I think then, then others will find beauty there. In, in some sense, this is so ironic, but in some sense, do you think that the words ugly and beautiful have kind of the same meaning because they're so subjective depending on who you ask? Yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, it, it's essentially the same thing. You're right, isn't it? It's, 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 it's defining um, a characteristic of physical being in a, in a particular way. 
Um, and it's just one's down this end of the spectrum, the other one's at the other end. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, you're probably you're probably right in that sense. And that's kind of why I'm kind of so keen to um, uh, own the term ugly. You know, I, I do not think I'm... Um, I'm beautiful. I certainly don't think I'm um, uh, uh, objectively, aesthetically beautiful. Um, um, but I'm also kind of comfortable with, you know, this set of physical characteristics um, um, presenting a sense to the world that is definitely not beautiful. Um, and I consider myself ugly, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. And in, in, after listening to you talk and after reading so much about you, one of the biggest things that I took away was, is the idea around transparency. So your mom had this journal that she never hid from you. She let you read it. She let you ask questions about it. You now encourage people to ask you questions about uh, your differences do you think that there's a level of transparency that would actually benefit society as a whole in in like a sense of inquisitiveness where we are not afraid to ask questions that you know a lot of us are afraid to ask not to offend yeah. somebody or hurt their feelings um i think absolutely yes um if if that um uh that transparency was there but it needs to be there on both sides and I think mm. um you know my reticence would be that you know sometimes it's too easily weaponized um and and it's incredibly easy for me as someone um uh you know um growing up um growing up male growing up reasonably privileged um my disability and difference notwithstanding um you know uh i think that transparency is really um really valuable and it's really important um but it's also um incredibly easy to erode and take advantage of um and and i'm not quite sure how we work through that and i think when you look at um when you look at issues around culture and um, race and gender and sexuality, um, you know, often you can see um, transparency taken advantage of. Mm. So, but I think, I think, um, you know, the, uh, I, I think the, the if you more approach, transparent, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Um, but I think the more transparent people can be, um, then um, there's more opportunity for others who are going through similar circumstances to kind of um, see and relate and understand and learn from um, past history. So um, certainly um, it's something that's really important to me and, and I'm, you know, I'm loud and obnoxious and an extrovert, so I'm in inclined to be um, pretty transparent. Um, and I think it's really important and I certainly kind of encourage people who are um, different in in whatever way, shape or form to be as transparent as they can. Um, but I think it's also important we acknowledge that that it doesn't always play out for um, people as well as it's played out for me. I think I think the key that I was missing in my question is transparency with good intent. Uh, yeah. your, your mom had good intent in showing you that journal. No, it wasn't to hurt your feelings. It was to help you understand. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you, what would you consider have been some of the most beautiful moments in your life so far? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think probably, um, I think for me, and, and certainly um, as I age, a lot of the mo a, a lot of the more beautiful moments in my life have been the incredibly simple ones. Mm. Um, you know, um, sitting sitting round our um, kitchen table, eating a Sunday roast with um, um, all the family, um, and as my brothers and sisters had kids, you know. 
um, nieces and nephews. Um, you know that 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 is incredibly um, um, incredibly beautiful. Um, then there's probably all of those moments that a lot of people would describe. Um, uh, you know, getting married, having kids. Um, that they've been very beautiful moments. Um, I think probably for me also um, just just being able to um, and having the opportunity through writing my book and doing my TED Talk and talking about all this stuff, some of the really nice moments have been um, uh, just connecting with a lot of kids and having conversations with them, um, you know, on book tours, in schools, um, just being super transparent. And I think, um, uh, you know, I, I'm really upfront, um, about, um, my story and, um, I, I've certainly had, um, teachers say to me, like before doing a talk to, to, um, to particularly the younger kids, oh, they're a bit noisy and, you know, <laughs> they, they, might, they, 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 they might be a bit disruptive. I'm like, they'll be fine. It's kids are kids. Um, but I think one of the things that I think I've found um, really, really meaningful is um, uh, that being able to kind of connect with kids through story. And mm. I think one of the things, um, um, you know, uh, kids are, um, you can't fool kids. And I think if you're standing up in front of a group of um 40, 80, 150 um, kids, whether they're in um, grade four or year four or year 12, um, they they can smell if you're disingenuous. Um, Absolutely. They, they, they know if you're trying to spin them a story that isn't true or isn't real. Um, and I've never, not once, not once had a single kind of um, um, problem um, connecting with kids um, and, and just getting a lot of really, um, really lovely, interesting, engaging questions, um, sweet questions, funny questions, challenging questions, all those kinds of things. And the is kids a, just want it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I was going to ask, is there a question that a kid has asked you that has kind of stuck with you? Um. I think, uh, well, there's probably a couple. I think I often get asked about, well, what do you think about your mum when she didn't want to take you home? And, and um, um, you know, and, and I get asked, oh, you're married, you've got a girlfriend and those kinds <laughs> of things. Um, uh, I think there are a couple that have stuck with me um, and some of them are really, um, you know, I've certainly had questions about kids who have had individual and are going through individual experiences of bullying. And I think it's, it's, it's really hard because I think you, you don't want to, you don't want to say to them, um, I'll just toughen up. You'll be fine. Cause that's not what they need. I think um, what you can offer them is say, it was really tough for me. And there are a lot of really hard moments and um, I, I don't want to dismiss or um, lessen that at all, but I'm here and, you know, um, things get things get infinitely better when you leave school for a whole bunch of reasons. You can wear what you want, do what you want. Um, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions as well. Like I went to, I was with one, um, one grade, um, I think one year nine class, year eight or nine class, and it was in in America. I'm trying to remember which city, but mm -hmm. uh, there was this young boy who was in school who was Scottish. Okay. Um, and he was getting picked on a bit because of his accent. Um, and of course, what I wanted to say is like, give it two years, and and the girls or the boys will love that accent, and you'll be fine. Um, That's so but, true. You know, <laughs> it's true, but also not appropriate to say in in front of right. in front of the class. Um, but it's those kinds of questions that kind of stick with me, the ones about people's individual experiences where I think it's kind of, um, it's really arrogant if I was to suggest that that my experience will be theirs. 
But I mean, I think what I try and do then is is just you know express to them um, intellectually and emotionally that, that there's a bit of a Venn diagram and there's some overlapping circles where perhaps they can take away some of my experience um, and and reflect on that, but also um, understand that there are um, other kids in the class who are just going through their own version of exactly the same thing. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. And uh, my final question is, so I write a newsletter called The Profile, and the way I describe it is I say that I study the world's most successful people. And when people first hear that, it's success. The word success is kind of like the word beauty. It, you can yeah. define it a million different ways. And to me, success is not the classical uh, definition of success. The way I see success is somebody has gone through something, they've learned lessons from that, and then they've come out on the other side with those lessons and built something meaningful, whether, you know, it's a company, a life, uh, you know, a relationship, something, something meaningful came from those challenges. Uh, so I want to, for my last question, I want to ask you, what does the word success mean to you? Uh, I think success to me um, means uh, being whole. Uh, and I think uh, it goes to the point of saying, um, uh, are you at peace with who you are? Um, uh, do you feel like, um, you know, most parts of your life are working well most of the time? Um, I don't think everyone's life is always working perfectly all of the time. Um, but for me, I think success is that sense of um, whether it's overcoming physical, emotional, psychological, financial, you know, whatever kind of um, struggles to, um, to, get, to get somewhere that you are comfortable with. Because I think, you know, my, my definite, definition of success is not yours, is not anyone else's. So I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of external indicators of success, you know, wealth, health, a whole a whole bunch of things, um, and there it's not that they're not meaningful. Um, I think probably the most important thing for me is success is about um, your level of comfort with yourself. Um, do you feel whole, um, fulfilled? Do you feel engaged with the world, um, with your family, with friends? Do you feel like you're doing something important and adding something um, valuable to the world? Um, and, and if you feel like you're doing that most of the time, then that sounds pretty successful to me. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Robert. That was an Thank amazing you. conversation. <laughs>